there's so there's so many things within the press right now that are creating a lot of confusion because there's not one person standing there going oof this is the truth you know bah mm, and, totally, you know, totally, totally. so so it's kind of there's this this whole uh this whole thing that's playing out right now with us being in lockdown i'm not sure what it's like with you in australia and mm. in Brazil, but um i think a lot of the the vibration and energy that's being created is a lot around fear mm. and um and then also just the confusion with like what is actually fact and what is not yeah well gareth and i Cool stuff. Let's start this off. Joe Fanica, Big Joe, Jungle Joe. Seriously, bud, welcome to the Ridiculously Human podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Gareth and Craig, absolute uh, honor to be on your on your podcast with you. Thank you. <laughs> so, man, so stoked. I'm so stoked. Seriously, man. I, I, I just like you hold this amazing energy about you, bud. Like, uh, I mean, we've been chatting back and forth over audio message on whatsapp and I, you just have this presence about you but so thank you for that because it's very powerful you know you hold a very powerful space and it's just been very like positive for me just interacting with you um to kind of set this podcast up so can't thank you enough you know for coming on the show like we we're saying before this started I'm still kind of starstruck and a little bit nervous chatting to you, but um, you just make it so easy, bud, with your big smile and your great energy. So thank you very much for that. Ah, oh, likewise, Gareth. I think I think that's the thing that stood out for me too, brother. Is you know the positive energy, the way that you guys have dealt with uh, the preparation of this. It's it's been absolutely spot on, and I, you know it's it's infectious positivity. It's when you when that infectious positivity comes out, it's like a, a two-way stream and it just ripples into everything, you know? So yeah, thank you so much for that too. Oh, they are bad. No worries, my man, no worries. So, so I just want to like maybe start this off with a, a, a tiny little bit of a story, a bit of a quick one, right? So just the kind of manifestation of this chat is like really interesting for me in a way. Like my, one of my, literally my oldest mates, uh, Andrew Hamilton, a guy that I went to primary school with, uh, he messaged me like about a month ago. He messaged me an article about you. And uh, he's like, oh, check this about um, Joe Fanikirk. And he's like, and then I was like, oh, cool. That's really, really interesting. And he's like, oh, you should try to get him on the show. And I'm like, yeah, I should. And then I was like, but I don't know how I'm going to get him on the show. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and, then, and then like we had uh, AJ Fenter on. And without even saying it, anything to him, like he just said at the end of the show, he's like, Hey, you guys should really have Joe Fanikirk on your show. It'd be flipping awesome listening to you. And, um, uh, sorry, awesome listening to you, Oaks Chat, you know? And I was like, yeah, yes, if you can put us in touch, that'll be amazing. And then, like, since then, there's been all these other connections which have kind of happened off the back of that. Um, I, I've uh, been chatting to my stepbrother a bit more than usual. You and him went to high school together. Um, I've been uh, sending a few messages to a guy called Oliver Niemant, who's a friend of mine as well. And he said, you Oaks are like best mates. You know, you went through the whole of high school together. So just, it's just so cool how this has kind of brought so many other people together, you know, just through wanting to have a podcast discussion, which is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's so true. It's so true. Um, <clears throat> that's the thing that I noticed, you know, just after we started chatting and the emails were going, um, obviously AJ was the, was the one that put me onto you guys and said, hey, would you be interested in that? And and uh, I trust AJ, you know, and, and just what a, what a beautiful human being he is. So, so when he said it, I was like, he was like, I think this, this would be good for you. And I was like, well, okay, I'm, I'm in brother. I'm in. <laughs> and then, and then obviously all the connections opened up, like you say, with, with, uh, with some of your old schoolmates coming in, Sean Emoth, I got hold of Sean Emoth and his two, uh, now he's got two kids. I actually thought that was Gareth's kids at first, but <laughs> but turned out they were Sean's kids. So, you know, it's incredible. Uh, you know, we're all connected, clearly. Um, yeah, but it's, so, it's it's just so cool, man. I think in, in South Africa, like, in South Africa, we just have more connections, I think, than, than other places. I just feel like somehow somebody knows somebody. And, and there's this really cool thing about South Africa, which I, I, I think you only start maybe noticing sometimes once you've left. And I think that is like such a cool thing about the country. 
Um, so, so yeah, but maybe we can like, we can start off with, uh, you know, you and your story and, and, uh, you know, like something really tragic and sad, um, happened to you when you were 14 years old. Um, your, your old man passed away in, in an accident and, um, you know, you, you've spoken about this before and like, you know, it, it kind of held you held some trauma, uh, without kind of even knowing about it for like over 20 years um, throughout your life, you know, um, but, but I was just wondering if maybe you can just talk us through kind of, you know, what happened, um, you know, that, that kind of day and also perhaps leading up to it. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I actually, my mom and my dad got divorced when I was three years old. So, um, so they, they lived in separate, uh, provinces back in South Africa. And um, on this particular day, I had been going back to Cape Town. I was going to school in, at King Edwards, and I ended up going back that day to go and visit my dad in, in Cape Town. And on the first day uh, that, that I saw him, he was like, come, we're going to go and watch some rugby. And I even remember it was Transvaal versus Western Province at Newlands. So we went there, we hung out, it was so cool. My dad was the kind of guy that, you know, give you a big sloppy kiss on the, on the lips. You know, he was <laughs> so loving and, and just a, a beautiful soul. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's, we watched the game together. Thereafter, we went back to his place. Uh, we were relaxing and um, his wife at the time and him were going out to dinner. And he was, he ca I remember it in like so clearly, like, he came to me and he, he gave me a big kiss and he said, I love you so much. And, and he left. And that was about eight o'clock at night. The following morning, I fell asleep. I woke up the next morning at around 10 o'clock. And for some reason this morning, I woke up and it just, there was just a strange energy. Like normally if I just come there on holiday, my dad would be there and he would be around and, you know, and there would be time for us to interact and, the minute that I opened my eyes, he would have been there. And then this time, I, it, it wasn't the same. And there was just a weird energy. And then uh, my stepmother wasn't there either. Um, and so I was, I was really like freaked out about it. I was thinking, oh, no, oh okay, maybe, maybe they've just gone to the shop or there's something that they've done. Um, and then she ended up coming back, my stepmother. And, and, and she told me that my dad had been killed in an accident the night before. Um, and... Yeah, I just, I just broke down and it broke down in tears and, and, uh, yeah, just, I, I can't really describe the pain. I think we've all felt similar kinds of pains in our lives as human beings, but, but, um, a 14 year old boy to feel that kind of pain. Um, and really for me, the first kind of experience in life of impermanence, the impermanence nature of, uh, this life that we live in. Um, you know, be, a, a physical form being there one day, your father, someone you love very much and the next gone. And it was like very sudden. And so, yeah, so I think just merely because of, of the fact that it was so sudden and so fast that as a 14 year old, you didn't really know how to deal with that kind of yeah. pain. Um, and and so, yeah, so I carried that with me for, for a long time after that without actually consciously realizing that it was affecting other aspects of my life um, until very late on, uh, only, only probably another yeah, 15 years, 20 years after that, did I actually start to um, realize uh, what that trauma had meant for me in my life and, and, and also how, how, what a kind of effect it had on me um, as I, when I was growing up. Mm. Oh, but, uh, Thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, I mean, this heart wrenching, you know, just to even hear it now is, just, is, is so hard to hear and just to imagine what, what your, how it must have shattered your whole life, you know, because, you know, just having, having that connection with your dad and geez, I mean, and, and as you said, at such a young age, you, it's a very influential was important time of a, of a youngster's life. And I mean, did you have support? Like, did, were there people around you that were like buddies and, and friends? And how was the, how did people sort of interact with you after that? Um, I, I, I had, uh, praise God, I had had a very, very uh, strong mother who kind of, you know, she's like, 
my rock basically she just kind of stepped in and uh, she had been like that ever since I was a young young boy she had always been a mother that was driven first of all um, a single mother had a lot of determination <clears throat> and so she just fired and mm. and you know she was she was my rock through that time and I remember I just remember her always being so caring uh, so loving <clears throat> and you know, really stepping into that role in a way. But, you know, as a, as a youngster, when that something like that happens, <clears throat> it can be very difficult because you now all of a sudden have to become this adult. And or, even if that is not said, even if your mom is not coming to you and say, yo, now you need to be the, the dad or you need to be the man of the family kind of thing, that energy is kind of gets transferred and you kind of feel like, oh, I am now the man of the family in a way. And so it's kind of like growing up very quick. And <clears throat> just with that, I think um, that affected different parts of life uh, when I was growing up. And, and specifically, I think that I had felt this pain that was so, you know, so intense that, that later on in life, it, be, it, it almost gave a sense of invincibility. Like, you know, I've received this pain now, nothing's going to, nothing's going to affect me. You know, I can, I can do anything and it doesn't matter. Like I'm strong, I can get through it, you know? And I think that some of those uh, traits were within my mom and she passed those to me. She, 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 you know, you know, you got to be strong and you got to get through this and it will be okay. But then as I've learned more and my consciousness has evolved, I've kind of like realized that, that, you know, um, those emotions that we feel, are necessary to feel you know and for us to kind of just suddenly get over things you know life it doesn't work in that way because if we try to just suddenly get over it and be strong you know it starts to affect different parts of our lives and i think that's where the emotional side of things when those kind of emotions come up it's it's actually it's actually better to feel that emotion as much as you can and then it allows it to be released you know but but if if we kind of push it away then it's like oh then it creates all kinds of um other um issues for us so so i think that that's one of the things about being a vulnerable man too is you know it's like we get sad and we get we 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 not all the time it's not always just these emotions that are you know joyful or you know uh, peaceful or things like that there's there's things in life where where those emotions are hard to deal with. And I think that's, you know, I, I always take the, 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 the root of saying that whatever happened to me in my life was, was hard. Okay. That was a hard experience to go through, to go through, but, but there's always other people who are kind of, I always feel in a more disadvantaged position. And I always feel like, wanting to be in their shoes, you know, like wanting to walk in their shoes to really feel like, okay, where is this person? Um, and so that like leads into a whole nother thing. But, but it's like, I think it's super important that when the judging mind comes and it wants to say, Hey, like, Oh, but look at that guy, he's doing this or whatever. It's like, no, just be in his shoes for a day and then we can talk, you know, but mm. so so in my situation with losing my dad, of course, now I realize what that, how that affected me later on in life. But um, in the time, no way. <laughs> yeah. I create, create like all sorts of kind of ways to protect yourself and be like, okay, I don't want to feel that again. So, you know, how can, how can I be strong? And, you know, that creates a whole different kind of energy, which I only really saw later on in life how it how it did affect me wow wow joe look there's you know there's so many different kinds of soulful journeys that that can go and, and there's initiations that happen and i just feel like that's a really strong one for such a young age and such a but then kind of what you're saying there's a massive bigger picture and soulful journey that 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 this is a sort of path that this has put you on and it's kind of a, an extreme example of how things in life always manifest later on in, in a way that there's a reason for it maybe or something like that and and sometimes you have to choose to see things that way and and see the real 
massive picture of it. And yeah, I think you've taken some, yeah, you've taken something from that that's turned you into this, this massive heart space human being, you know, and, and, and maybe that might've been different, uh, you know, without that crazy initiation that you've gone through, you know? Oh, no, no, without a doubt. I think, I think the unbearable things in life only allow us to open our hearts more because some of the things that take place, you know, we, we can't even bear it. So we can't, we can't understand. And it's like, it's in that moment that that's when the heart just cracks open again. Mm. You know? And that actually is the mystery of like this, this life that we are living. I mean, we are life itself, but we are the, we are the mystery, you know, and mm. each and every single day on planet earth right now feels like that. It feels like we are living through a time which is, which is um, unprecedented uh, in terms of our history on planet earth. And, and so it's kind of, every single morning is and every single day is another opportunity and what i see as as the mystery of life you know the mystery that we each day get a chance to learn how to die in a way because mm. it's like we're leading to that point at some point it's inevitable you know i keep referring back to that one text but it's like what is what is uh what is um what are the two things that are certain as human beings? One of them is taxes and one of them is death, you know, and there's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, Bhagavan Das kind of um, uh, thing that he says. And he says, um, if, if, if living won't get you there, dying will. And it's like basically meaning that like the more that you contemplate death, the more that in each and every single step of your life, you, you'll be considering that, that, that this life is, extremely precious and and um and that that each and every single day that if you if you can't if you can't uh, think of god think of death because it's like it it, it takes you there you know mm. wow so just um talking about you know being here now and and you know things that happen right here is is a little bit about your rugby background and, and that kind of thing. It's, we, we couldn't not go there. And I mean, it seems a bit strange to sort of segue into that because there's so much stuff which we'll come back into with, with that, what you're talking about. But we also had a moment before we chatted about these connections and Gareth was saying how these, these beautiful uh, connections with friends have come back into the picture. And it's actually weird that it's kind of happened to me too, even though we haven't been chatting directly and, you know, our connection uh, is that we both from PE and my dad was a CARES boy as well. And it's these weird, and then I've been chatting to a few friends that were at CARES and I just asked them, you know, about your history and like, you were like a hero at school, seriously. Like people were like, yeah. this guy is like, was a prodigy rugby player, you know? And um, so you were bored at CARES. Um, and how, how did that sort of time in your life shape and influence you? <clears throat> You know, I think, I think in one way that was a master stroke for me because um, my mom was a single mom. Obviously, she had to work every day. And, you know, he has a 14-year-old, just lost his father. Like, what are you going to do, you know? And so she kind of headed me in the direction of King Edward the Seventh School. And, and, um, and as a boarder, a weekly boarder at King Edward's. And, you know, truly, like, after after that situation with uh, that happened with uh, my dad, um, I actually got in myself into trouble at King Edwards, and I was almost actually expelled. I don't know, <laughs> but but um, what happened was is that uh, obviously the, the the trauma and the emotion of of losing my father was was very traumatic. And when I went back to school, I'd been going to classes, and um, I'd been. Uh, going to art class and <laughs> the art teacher yeah. he she said to me yeah can you like we had to do this drawing and it had to be kind of an abstract drawing of like a, a some kind of being like a supernatural being and so I went that weekend and I worked and it was basically homework and we had to show the to show them on the Monday or the Tuesday of the next week and I had to draw this drawing so what I did is I drew this drawing but it you know it took me took me the whole weekend. I put in a lot of effort, a lot of time. And, um, and so I went and we had to all present our artwork to the teacher. And when I, when I went to the, 
the, the her table i showed her and she said to me oh this is too cartoon like like i don't really know what you've done here and kind of shrugged it off you know and i was just like in my mind i was thinking you don't know how much time i put into this you know and so when i was walking back to the the desk uh, I'm like, I look at my one friend, I mean, my one friend, uh, Matt Kayward, and I say to him, this fucking bitch told me. <laughs> and, like, and this woman, this woman, she was like, before this, she was at the uh, deaf and blind school. She was, she was, she could read lips. Oh. And so, <laughs> but basically I went back and she read my lips and she just got up and she started crying and she just said, Panika, get out. And she started crying and she ran out. And so I was, I was like, yeah, I, I, unfortunately I was able to stay at King Edwards um, and then, yeah, continue the journey. But, but yeah, that was just one, one, uh, one part of me growing up. And I definitely think that had to something to do with the emotional uh, um, pain, if you want, or, or stress. But, um, but yeah, no, King Edwards, oh, I just have so many fond memories you know um uh of of this of the life as a as a, bo a weekly border and then you're yeah, just the, all the mates the brotherhood i think that really taught me so much and you know not having a father figure in your life um being with your mates uh, every week and then you know the the camaraderie that was 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 present at king edwards was something so tangible and so so incredible you know it was like and and so for me it was a real honor and a privilege to be at king edwards and and then yeah all these all the mates you know you lose connection with them and then suddenly um i was off social media for i think about five years through this process so so you know reconnecting back has just been it's been really cool and i i just feel like it's the right moment for that you know but but yeah king edwards ah oh, Come on the Reds, you know, just, just <laughs> yeah. so, so staunch. People are yeah. going to be stoked to hear that in this set. Some yeah. will, some won't, I suppose, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, honestly, I remember, right? I, was, I wasn't a um, private schoolboy or anything. I went to Four Ways High, um, but my, like I said, Sean, as you know, went there, Sean Emoth. And um, I always used to go watch your Oaks rugby matches on Saturdays. And... It was so awesome, but like the, the whole school, you know how cool it was. The whole school would be there and they'd have the Oaks doing the war cries and it was just yeah. like super energetic. And literally everyone was always waiting for Flip and Joe to get the ball because you knew when he was getting the ball, something was happening. Yeah. You know? And it was like, you were totally like this um, hero at the school, but then and I'm Wasn't sure. Wasn't it that Oaks... Easter weekend, Gareth? Wasn't it that? Um, no, but every. Was the, when, every, was the, when, every when was that big one? There was like a big event, like a. They at used Kez. to have a few. Oh, at Kez, yeah. I'm not sure actually, but I know oh, oh, I there was always the one at Kez. No, no, no. This was like every every Saturday. Like then they played oh, rugby yeah, yeah. during the season, you know. Um, oh, yes. And uh, yeah, so yeah. We, used to, we used to have the festivals, like the festivals down in PE. We used to go there. And then, gray. Yeah, Gray PE. We we yeah. we played in the festival there, and then also uh, the Saint Stidians Festival. I think we oh. played in that uh, also. So. So yeah, there were those festivals that we played in, and then, um, but but yeah, like like Gareth was saying, it's it's um, you never you never forget like when you're um, a schoolboy rugby player and you're playing in the first team for the Reds. Um, I was fortunate enough; I got drafted in there at like I think 16 years old. So I played my first year on the wing, number 14, and then the next year. I played, uh, I moved to the second row, which was like the lock position. And I had one of those Adrian Richter, like leather <laughs> banding that I used to wear. You had this like strap, so to keep the cauliflowers from arriving. <laughs> um, I had that on. And then, um, and then, yeah, I just jawed and, you know, 15 years old playing rugby for kids in the, the fifth, I think it was the 15 A's and playing lock, you know, and then, going from wing on, which is like out in the open to the lock <laughs> position. And then, and then the following year getting selected to play for the first team. So it was like, and, and then playing sometimes lock and flanker. And then the last two years was, was playing uh, loose forward uh, number eight and number six and seven. Yeah. So, 
But, um, but Joe, like you said, I mean, I will, you keep that in your heart and in your spirit for, for your life, you know, because um, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, there's something about camaraderie too. Like the way that brothers, like that's, that's one of the biggest philosophies for me for, for, for rugby in general. If you can get the boys to play for each other, you've gone like 80% of the way there. <laughs> then just put in your details of like what you want them to do, but then, but get them to play for each other, play for the coach, play for each other. You, you, can, you can create magic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, cool. man, that's so cool, man. Yes, I can just feel that flipping yeah. positivity and like, you know, that, that rejoicing, those cool memories and reminiscing, but it's so, it's so <laughs> awesome, my man. <laughs> so look, your, your rise to the top in rugby was, was really quick, but then you, I think you played for SA Schools under 19, under 21, and, and, and I think you captained all of those team to, teams too. And uh, you went on to play for the Springboks uh, without even playing like Curry Cup in Super 15, which is just crazy if you think about it. Um, so, but maybe you could just tell us, but what was it like um, playing for the Springboks for the first time? You know, what were your memories, your emotions, like all those sort of things? Well, it's, it's crazy because ridiculously human, it's like I'm getting the goosebumps like I'm playing a game. You know? It's like really, really simulating the same kind of vibration. It's the same, like come on the reds. I was feeling yeah. the, my hair stand up, you know, and, <laughs> and the same thing with the spring wax. It's like you, you're standing on the side, you're a 21-year-old kid and you've got to go now and you, you look across and you see the All Blacks and you see Jonah Lomu, Anton Oliver, Case News, all these guys that are – you know, how, how did I end up here kind of thing? But, um, but yeah, and, and running, I think it was uh, the first test match was in Newlands. And it was on that day we played the All Blacks and it was raining. And um, I just kept thinking to myself, I hope I don't drop the ball. Because you know? yes. <laughs> it's like your first test match in the rain against the All Blacks. Like, okay, mm. yeah, thanks a lot for that. No never pressure. played Curry Cup, never played Super Rugby, anything. So... I was, yeah, but, but I was, I was fortunate enough to go through the, the ranks, you know, and I think that playing SA under 19, playing SA under 21 and, and playing a couple of years in those, um, in those teams was, well, there was just the wasp. Um, playing in those teams was, was uh, no doubt pre preparing me for that moment. And, um, some people may say, yeah, but you didn't play any Curry Cup and you didn't play any Super Rugby. How could you be prepared for that? Well, I, I just think that the coaches had a belief in me. And, and, um, and yeah, when, I, when it actually got to the moment of playing, it was like not just looking at their team as the All Blacks, but looking at our team, you know, guys that I'd, I'd like literally, when I was a schoolboy, I was looking up to these guys and now I'm here with them. And it's like Andre Fenter, um, Andre Force and these loose forwards that were absolute beasts when I was playing. And then here I am and I'm mingling it with them. So, so yeah, that was pretty surreal, the whole, the whole process. And then I can remember um, the ball somehow got kicked in the, in the rain and, and I had just come on. I think I played like a cameo of 16 minutes or something off the bench, but um Obviously, the minute that you run onto the field, my heart was going like, doof, doof, yes. doof. okay, just, just catch the ball. That's all you got to do. Do the basics. Yes. Just do the basics. And um, I remember in one moment in the game, the ball got kicked and I was the one that was there to first receive it. So I was running back and I could just remember, right, okay, this is, this is a chance. This is your chance. <laughs> <laughs> and I go back and I like, dive on the ball because at Newlands, you know, to catch a ball in that rain, it was always a thing, but, but run back, dive on the ball, get up. And then I got like a chance and I, and I basically just went into motion and, and just ran as fast as I could. <laughs> and, um, and I remember getting caught. I got scragged like, but I, I managed to get like, I think about 30, 40 meter run, which was, which was, I was just like so grateful, you know? Wow. Yes, but that's so cool, man. I, I swear, I always thought you were a bit of like a wing disguised in a flank's body, like uh, your, your whole career. And I can only imagine what it must have been like literally picking that ball up and running for 40 meters. But it must have been so surreal, man. So, yeah, that's super cool, buddy. Yeah. And uh, so, 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 Joe, like, you know, talking about 
that that whole experience, right? Like if we look at the bigger picture of it all and like sort of at the highest, you know, playing at that massive high level of rugby, what, what did this sort of mean for you in the bigger picture and sort of maybe, you know, some of the upsides and downsides in your opinion? I, th- I, th- I would definitely like to share that, that I, I think any youngster that goes into a level of uh, playing against men who are like grown men, I think that that obviously, um, you know, it happens more often. And I know in Super Rugby, the likes of George Smith, he was playing at 19, you know, he was playing Super Rugby. So, so um, obviously we've got different uh, genetic builds and we are made up in a different way, you know, um, in in terms of our, our build and, and also our muscular uh, kind of composition. So, so yeah, so for me, um, I would definitely say that being, being uh, you know, kind of fast-tracked to the Springboks in a way, um, I think that it came with, it, it was a beautiful thing, but it also came with um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, cons, can I say, because for the human body, of course, like we're still, when you're obviously you're 21 years old, you're still growing, you know, and um, you're playing against men that are 27, 28 years old. And um, obviously their muscular structure is, is formed and they are men. And so, so just the mere fact of that, I think that that played a part. I, I was, I had quite a few injuries um, in my younger days and uh, specifically uh, playing, playing in South Africa. Um, and I think that was partly because of being put into that, onto that stage and that level at a very young age. Um, I think it had something to do with it. Um, but um, I, would, I would definitely say that, that um, these players should be nurtured, you know, um, and really um, guided in a way. Um, because you don't know when you're 21 years old. You don't know. And or even when you're 19 years old, you know. So... Um, so I would say definitely uh, you need strong mentors in place to be able to guide the guys through. Um, but I, yeah, I think growing up in South Africa too, there was definitely a culture of, you know, play hard, uh, party hard kind of thing, you know, and um, all of our kind of mentors growing up, that's what they were up to. So, you know, you used to see the guys out at night on the Wednesday nights, you used to see them at the places and, uh, um, and they're dancing and, you know, uh, doing their thing. And so this kind of, this kind of culture was within us before we even started. And I think a lot of our mentors, um, were doing that. So we kind of, that's the kind of way that we went as well. And, um, if anything, I could say that obviously I see through that culture right now, but when you're in it, obviously that's, that's a a very big part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Wow. But jeepers, man! Out of interest, who was um, or who were some of your mentors in the in the game when you were playing, or, or were they maybe not even rugby guys? No, I think I think obviously one person I always looked up to as a young rugby player growing up was Bob Skinstad. Mm. Uh, I think Bob Skinstad was like one of the most unbelievably talented uh, players that's played the game, you know. And so him as a youngster growing up and and witnessing him was was he was he was always someone that that i um that was kind of a mentor for me then there was also another coach called eugene Ilof, uh who's a coach of the lions he was he was more like a kind of a father figure in a way um for my junior years of rugby um and playing for uh then transvaal which now is the Karting lions playing for them and he was always like a steady like kind of pillar in my life and specifically in rugby. And he also had the, had an amazing gift and he still does of being able to spot talent, you know, and mm. um, he kind of took me under his wing and, and, uh, and he helped me a lot you know, to grow as a, as a human being as well as a, as a rugby player. Um, going further back, obviously to 15 years old, watching the Springboks win the 1995 world cup, Nelson Mandela, what a hero. Mm-hmm. And yeah, obviously Francois Pina, who was the captain of the team, both of them stood out as, as mentors for me in life. Um, and specifically uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, what an what a absolute gem. 
Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, legend. Eh? Tell me about it. Yeah, I wish we were at like my my house where, in London when I when we normally do the podcast because uh, I have a, a nice painting of Mandela there. So he would have been a nice addition for this chat, I think. <laughs> wow, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Hey, but so I'm also wondering, like, obviously in life, like, um, you know, our roles reverse. And um, who, who did you kind of like start mentoring uh, in the rugby world? I guess uh, maybe towards the end of your career. Uh, we we had a couple of young players uh, that came through the ranks uh, when I was playing at Toulon uh, in the south of France, um, and yeah, my my role there was pretty much that. You know, um, uh, if anything, uh, sharing sharing the wisdom that you've learnt over the years. And there was a couple of young players there that had come through the ranks that were starting to perform and perform really well, and they were they were kind of the old dogs were kind of getting put a bit to the side and these youngsters were starting to come in. So, so um, I think that that transition was definitely uh, opened the space to be able to help them in their process of becoming better rugby players, better human beings. And so, so there was a few of those youngsters that came through at uh, Toulon Rugby and uh, Rugby Club Toulon A, as they put it. But um but yeah, I would say that those though that was where I really felt that that came into play, and then also obviously just stepping more into a leadership role in in teams. Um, I think from a very young age, I'd always been kind of uh, kind of been put in a place of leadership. But um, after my dad dying and and going through that whole process, I think that I kind of shunned away from from wanting to take. Le- uh, leadership roles and um, obviously um, my off field there were some off field antics that were 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 were, ta- were taking place when I was a youngster like I was 21 years old when I got into the team so so um, so I think that those things perhaps affected what coaches and what the general kind of idea or feeling was about me as a leader and so perhaps I didn't get those roles when I was a lot young mm. I was a lot younger in those senior teams, but as time went on I, I, I was recognized as a leader in Toulon and then I was fortunate enough to step into it and I think that I was ready to step in when when I did as as a leader of the team That's yeah so but cool. um, just like I was wondering um what is kind of the perception be now of like this new Joe that I guess has emerged? Um, because you talk about leadership roles and these sort of things, but you, you have, you carry, like I said at the start, you carry this, um, this presence of you now, you know, but obviously you, you're not the rugby player anymore. You, you're Joe, the kind of oak that digs yoga and meditation and is touched with nature and all these sort of things. How has that kind of like been, you know, received from, your, your ex-colleagues and mates and that sort of thing? Oh, that's been an interesting process, man. <laughs> it's, <amazing. laughs> it's been very interesting, you know, because it's like there's, there's been, obviously there have been th- some things like where someone took a picture. I was going through a very heavy process of, of um, releasing a lot of things off the rugby and, and a, lot of, um, a lot of work on myself, uh, a lot of... Um, like I went into 21 day fasting and I, I really got in touch and I really wanted to clean the vessel after all of the carnage from the years before, from I think mm. 13 years of playing professional sport. So, so yeah, so cleansing, cleansing the body and, um, and, uh, and really getting into that. And I think that what happens is obviously people saw me before when I was playing for Toulon and, and, you know, as a rugby player, you get shot and it's just muscle and it looks like, you look like a, a raging bull, you know, in a way. Um, and then, and then they saw me. They, someone took a picture of me when I'd been going through my kind of spiritual awakening, in a way. And um, I kind of had a beard, and I was looking kind of lanky, and it kind of went viral in in South Africa. Well, this is what I'm told. And uh, and then I heard all of these stories coming back, and it was kind of like, oh, he, you know, Joe's got. He's got a disease and <laughs> there's yes. all these things started coming out. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. But, you know, maybe before when I was like really uh, like concerned by what other people thought, 
and my ego is still very strong, I would have been like, you know, I can't believe they're saying these things about me. It would have caused, caused the, like a complete drama um, for, for days, you know, maybe even weeks. But in this case, you know, with the spiritual work and calming the mind and, and, and more living from your heart and, and really connecting and, and stepping back more in a way from stepping back from all the social networks and the world of this, this world of the internet um, really allowed me to connect with myself. And so just the mere fact that when these kind of things started going viral, um, it was pretty interesting to see my reaction of where I was with it. You know, like, was I reacting in the way that like, oh, they're saying this about me with all this like tension and creating frustration? Or was I able to hold space and be, be like, oh, they're saying this about me. Okay. Uh, and really know, you know, that, that, this is just part of the process. And so, you know, so it's been a little, um, it's been a little journey and process with that. Um, obviously I've learned so much just through that process. It's been a, probably a six year, seven, a six year process since stopping playing. Um, but you can really gauge, you know, you can really gauge where you are when, when things like that happen, you know, and then you can really see where, where you are in terms of your own spiritual work and, way in relation to to something like that you know mm, for yeah, sure these but... kind of things are often like like mirrors aren't they to to totally just see are there is there a thing triggering me here and if so then then what is that you know where is this coming from what what is this deeper thing and i guess you were saying before we started the conversation today joe was like um the listening and the witnessing is yeah. obviously a big piece in this that that you've learned to sort of be, you know, integrate as part of your being now, which is, yeah, that's a massive test when, you know, when people are talking about you, you know, on a, on a big scale, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, no, no, no. You, you, you hit it right on the head there, Craig. It's, it's like, I think that this is the process, you know, is like we, 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 we go through our lives and we, 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 we're taught from a very young age. We create like all this conditioning of kind of, um, like what life is in, in a sense and what it's about. And part of that was for me was growing up about achievement and success and mm. succeeding and being number one and all of these things and competition. And, you know, are you, are you good enough and all of these things. And so all of the cu accumulation of all of this and kind of related to the psychological mind of, of like what, who we think we are. And it's like, but the, the journey for me is like discovering like, who you think you are is not really who you are. Mm -hmm. But once, once you're living every single day of your life and you, and you kind of have this persona of what you think you are, is like it's, it's completely different to who you actually are and, and who I am. So that question, that question was like sprung up like a, like a crazy question for me after I finished playing because I really started to question like, who am I? Like, like, am I Joe, the rugby player? <laughs> you know, am I even a man? Someone might look at me and say, hey, like, that's pretty trippy, man. You, you're a man. Like, I can see you're a man. But in a way, it's like the essence of who we are is, 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 is not that. So, and even for me to do justice of wanting to talk about that is not going to do that. So, so that's why you... I, I tag you there because witness witnessing and presence is where it's at. Because if anything happens to you in, in your life and you've been aware of that and through these beautiful healing modularities and, you know, these different triggers that you talk about that on a daily basis, we are asked to kind of step into our power and are we making a reaction or are we responding? You know, there's a difference there. It's like, am I reacting to this situation in the way that can create more turmoil or more turbulence or, you know, just, just the mere fact of what we're going through on earth right now. If I followed the news and I took in all that data, I would be sitting here like a wreck. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to even, I wouldn't even be able to put a foot outside because I'd be too scared about the reality that, that, we're living in, you know, and it's kind of like, so 
that's where, and I always tie into the spiritual teachers, like, but Sri Muji has been like an absolutely massive, massive, massive um, uh, uh, guide and master for me in that way, because that reflection is, is the pure reflection of source and the infinite. So it's kind of like that, that just the reflection of that allows for all of these things that we carry and that we hold and that we judge and all of these things, it allows that for, for that to be dissolved. And so, so yeah, I've, I feel that the key, the key to, to all of these things is, is really discovering who we are. Um, and not as a facet, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Like I may be a journalist or I may be an, uh, someone um, who plays rugby or I may be a pilot or whatever I am, but that's just the facet of who we are, you know? And, and so the discovery of what we've been doing our whole lives is going out, like getting more achievement, going out into this reality has kind of shifted and the, the journey has gone back into ourselves to discover who we are. And then all of this, reality that we're living in can can take care of itself because because we know who we are but i'm not sitting here for one minute claiming that i have the key to knowing who i am but what i because that's a daily work and the daily work is like you say when those triggers come up to identify okay cool am i reacting or am i responding or um how how am i perceiving this situation am i you know, going off a tangent uh, when something happens in my reality, or am I able to be present with whatever comes up? And I think that that with everything that's going on right now, that is becoming more and more crucial um, in, uh, on planet Earth um, as humanity is discovering who you are. Because if you don't really know who you are, and that's another thing is Sri Muji, he always talks about that. He always says the greatest gift in the human kingdom is to discover who you are. And I must say, I totally agree with him. So, so you mentioned like you don't know who you are yet, but like at what point do you then know who you are? So that's, that's, the, that's the key and the kind of the, um, that's exactly what you're saying now is, is, is it's, it's a knowing as opposed to a, a thinking. So if I say that I don't truly know who I am, it's identifying who says that. Because if we as beings are already perfect, and when I say is like, we are already perfect as beings, you know, just for being, we are, we're enough, you know, but there's that thought that comes that, and that's what's so interesting now as to what you said, because when you identify that thought that actually says, I don't know who I am, you, you identify that you actually are. And that's, the, that's what presence for me is, 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 is being able to, to see and witness these things that come up um, and then realize that all of it is just phenomena that's passing. Um, even when you watch your mind in meditation, for instance, like you see that those thoughts that arrive it's only once I connect to the thought that it becomes a reality. And so there may be like some old mental debris that's kind of floating that pops up and then I connect to that thought. And then all of a sudden I'm living that out in my reality. And it's like, no, that's where the witness, that's where the spiritual work comes in is that I'm able to witness that and let that pass. Um, and it's the same thing with phenomena and things that come up in our body. Um, we, as, as we recognize who we are, then the, the presence, that presence, we are able to see from the presence. And so, so yeah, so it's interesting because I, I don't really want to talk about that in a sense, because it just is. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally so, get it. But and I think it's, I think it's really powerful, even if we just, are having a discussion like this, you know, I think that that is, that is the important thing as well. So that is very powerful. Um, 
just before, but like, I guess we move on to this, this cool, awesome transitionary period, new time of your life. But like, um, if we could just maybe like hop back one second, you know, like, or, you know, a little bit to, to the end of your rugby career, like maybe you can just, cause it's a, it's a good place to kind of lift off for the next part of the podcast. Like what actually was the reason that you kind of decided to retire from rugby and like, when did you know it was the right time? I, I got to the point. Uh, I got to the point where where I wasn't in the mix anymore. I was kind of. I played probably for the last six months. I probably played about three uh, three matches, and I was I was definitely I was an integral part of the team before. So for the six years before, I was solidly integral. And then for that final year that I played, I I wasn't being selected anymore, and so. So yeah, so a whole bunch of things came up for me, you know. Um, I also started to witness how other teammates were with the coaches when they weren't getting selected, and I kind of, I kind of put two and two together, and I realized that you know I'm not going to be one of those uh, players that come to training with a long face, um, with the energy low, and kind of affect the team in a negative way and so even though it was really difficult for me at stages and it, and I say what was it difficult for it was difficult for that part of me that was the psychological mind the part, part of me that wanted you know if I could say like the ego that wanted to be number one you know and the the ego that didn't want to let go that accept that this was happening and so there's there's always that internal struggle that would come up for me and I think it, it, it would come up for most sportsmen when they're not selected, you know, and, and uh, it brings up a lot of things. Um, but yeah, just changing the mindset, changing uh, the reality that you are going into every single day. And I think that that was when I started to really look into Buddhist teachings and into the Dalai Lama. And, and I started to look at how they would approach different things in their lives as things that were perceived as, as difficult. And, um, and you know, I think that gave me a lot of kind of, uh, it gave me a lot of confidence to be able to go to training and be, you know, not lose that, that uh, vibration of positivity, mm. come there with optimism. Even if I wasn't in the team, I was holding bags now, but, but you know, being the captain before and then going into that position was was yeah it was a it was a difficult situation to be in but i think that that was part of the transformation was like okay how am i going to perceive the situation how am i going to re respond to what's mm -hmm. happened and i could have come with that attitude of being like oh you know the coach is a dick and mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not selecting me and i should be selected and i can't <laughs> handle this and you know that whole story could have played out or uh, um or i could have been like you know what i'm gonna look at the situation and see where I can grow. And if I can grow through this, then, then it's all good and transform the energy that's supposedly negative into a positive. And mm. so that, that definitely, and like reading up and exploring, uh, exploring the Buddhist uh, way of life and, and how they are in these kind of situations really helped me to go through it. And mm. I think in the end I came through it and, and, it was not such a big deal, you know. It's like you build this story that like this thing that's happening to me now, it's so massive. And you know, this transformation that's happening, it's like that's one of the key words for me. It's transformation. And it's like we're growing through all these uh, processes. And I think it's just the way that we perceive it and, and where we are looking from that, that definitely um, can, can help us through these situations. Mm -hmm. Yes, man. You hit the nail on the head there, Joe. Like you can go through a variety of different situations, but if the, the center, like you said, the, 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 your inner being is coming of your energetics are in a good space there. There's, it's very difficult to find things that are truly will derail you. You know what I mean? Because you, and that just proves that point, you know, that you, you clearly had this deeper energetic thing that you were willing to perceive your external or the externalities of things in a certain way. And I think that's such a great lesson for us to always be like, it's, it's the, your perception, isn't it? Of like the world through, and, and you can work on that lens. You can practice what is the lens through which I'm seeing things and 
that makes all the difference in the world, literally. And I think maybe, maybe we can just talk about that because, you know, you speak about these, these tools that you've used and it, and it does take practice. You know, it's, it doesn't just happen. You know, you don't become a pro sports man or woman by just, by just showing up, you have to put the effort in. And if you want to get through the world in a sort of a harmonious way, I think that also takes practice. So what are some of the tools? I mean, you, 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 you went completely vegan, for example, you cut down on the prescription medications and stuff. Tell us a little bit about some of the tools, uh, you know, reading in the Buddhism teachings. Uh, tell us some of those kind of tools that you were using in this transitionary sort of period. Yeah, so, so, for, so for me, definitely um, for about the last year of playing rugby, I, I, I had always felt that there was something uh, worth exploring and that was like our kind of our spirituality you know and I had kind of always heard about yoga but never really looked at it in the, in the way um, that I did back then and more looked at it more as a physical just a physical thing you know uh, as opposed to being a really spiritual practice that calms the mind and brings us into the heart space so so I once I got towards the end of end of playing I, I, I'll never forget it the one day I woke up and um, this was the day after we had finished and we we had won all the trophies the team went on to greater hearts they did some amazing things and then the, but the next day for me I woke up and I had pain just so much pain in my body and um, and it was at that moment that I said to myself this is the moment that I'm I'm done with uh, chemical drugs when I say like pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol. Um, I'd already stopped drinking alcohol for about two years before that, two or three years before that. So I'd already been on that process of kind of like detaching from things that weren't serving me uh, and, and, you know, really, really allowing for us to, to be. And so, so yeah, so I went through that process and I'm, I, it was on that day, it was like my own self told me, it said, you can't keep going in this way and it's kind of reached that unbearable point where the shift had to happen and i like to think that that's where the spiritual awakening came in it was like okay you've reached this point you've lived out every form of pleasure in terms of the 3d reality that you live in the materialistic world you've done it all you've got the big house you've got the big car you've got the hot chick you've got all of these things but are you truly um, are you truly um, at ease in your heart and are you joyful? Um, and so there was always that. And so I definitely feel that um, the minute that I stopped playing when I had all this pain, the next day I decided that's it. I can't carry on in this way anymore. And so I dropped all those chemicals and, and that was for a period before that too, along with the organic food and really no, starting to learn more about organic food and what we're putting into our body temple. So it's like, so these things started to come to my awareness. And then I went on to a 21 day fast and without really researching it or going into the, like what it's about, I kind of just jumped in. Uh, and, and I lost, I think I lost about 15 uh, kgs in that period. And, um, and yeah, I just noticed a lot of things about myself, you know, a lot of things that were, you know, little addictions to certain things and the, the kind of the, uh, also seeing, yeah, the trauma that I've been carrying, different things that I'd absorbed into my body from, from playing rugby for all those years, the knocks and the aches and pains and all of these things. So um, I, I had done the 21 day fast and from that moment, um, it brought a lot of peace and uh but there was still something inside that was like go, wanting to go in a search you know and um i think that that was actually just searching for my own self like and it started with a lot of self-love you know um uh for all of the things that had happened in the past and all of the things that were perceived as bad and um things perhaps where I hadn't treated people in the way that I really wanted to, or that I know that knew that was good. Um, and different things that had happened um, before that, that I identified that didn't really make me feel good. And so, so that was the start of the cleansing process. But as I've learned from that point is like, 
the cleansing really never stops, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, when I say that, I mean, it's like um, things come up into your reality that you've got to deal with. And, and obviously, the, the cleansing, uh, cleansing of all of those bodies, you know, the mental, the spiritual, the physical, and the emotional, all of those. So all of those years getting to that point and that, that draw, drew me to um, a Vipassana retreat. Um, Oh, how was that? But like, that's, uh, that's, was that like a 10 day one or was that a, yeah. Yeah. That, that was a, a first 10 day, first 10 day Vipassana retreat. And I really observed like the monkey mind in that, in that retreat. Like it was, it was nuts. Can you tell us about it? Yeah. It, it, it was literally like, um, I, the, from the minute that I sat down, like my whole body was just didn't want to be there, you know? My spirit did, but my body was just like, oh, aches and pains. And they've got specific, um, specific uh, meditation techniques where you sit still for 50, uh, 55 minutes and you don't move. And there's like a sequence of chanting. And then you go into this technique, Vipassana technique, where, you, where it's basically you scan the body, and, but you don't react to any of the sensations that are coming up. So you just sit as the silent observer and you watch your you know you watch your mind and you also watch your uh the, the phenomena that's coming up in your body the aches and pains and all of these things and you know it's really hard when you first start meditating and you you've been playing rugby every single day of your life and you go into these this retreat and everyone's like super zen and you're sitting there and you're like, sure, I'm not going to get through this. You're still no. the raging bull in you there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. But, yeah. And you've got to do it for 10 days. <laughs> yes, yes. At this point, a skinny raging bull, but. But it's incredible because, yeah. you know, for the first four days, it's like a little mosquito or like, comes like zzz, and all you can think about is that mosquito man and you're just like <laughs> go, go, go. and so but it's crazy because you notice it's like you really notice the dynamic of your brain and how your mm -hmm. mind works you know and i think that that's what i take the most out of that is that you can you can sit still you know it's it's possible and specifically when you when you go into your heart space and you and you're able to just be there and, and be fine with that, you know, and, and then the technique comes in, in and you kind of observe the different phenomena that's taking place. And there can be like an ache and, and you, and it's really like you focus upon that and you just are with that, you know, so there's no running away, uh, you know, or pushing away. It's just, you're just there. And I can honestly say that the monkey mind, I don't know, like they say that, uh, that become, a, become the, don't be the servant to the mind, be the master of the mind, you know? So it's like, it's exactly that thing. And, and it, came, <laughs> it came clear to me in that, those moments. It's like, I saw the jibber, the, the jabber, like, who, like all of these judgmental thoughts, you know, like, what, where am I? Why am I sitting here? Like all of these things. And through this retreat, it's a silent retreat. So you don't communicate with anyone. You don't say thank you. You don't say please. You just, you know, you just stay within yourself. And, um, and so, so after the four days, all of a sudden, no more jabber, no more chat. Wow. Was just, it sudden? And for me, it was like, for me, it was, it, 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 it arrived after about the fourth day. It, it like this, just this calm. Wow. Calmness and just like a, like an inner peace. And, um, I think also partly because the body then started to adapt to the poses, the, the, the meditative pose that we were sitting in. And I obviously didn't always sit in uh, Lotus. I was, I was up on a chair at stages and just because of my aches and pains, I had like a, a, a slip disc when I was playing. So, so you also, but, but I take so much out of that, that 10 day silent retreat. It's such a, such a beautiful, beautiful, uh, process to go through. Sure. But yeah. And uh, well done for doing that. Cause it's, it's definitely no, 
um, you know, nothing easy. That's for sure. I haven't done one yet. Like I, Craig and I definitely want to do one. Um, so, so well done for getting through it, but, and I think it, yeah, like it is transformational for sure. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting how so many people in the world, like, you know, we, we struggle to sit down just for like 30 minutes in silence. You know, it's almost like, it's just weird that we can't even do that. Um, so doing it for 10 days is, is really, is truly incredible and, and sort of life changing. Um, one of the other things that, uh, that you, you speak about and, and you're, you're, you're a big sort of advocate of is, um, is plant medicine. And, uh, you, uh, I think it started for you with the journey of ayahuasca after you watched like a YouTube video and then kind of went into that kind of a little bit more. So, um, Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that journey. What, what, like what happened for you? What was your experience of your ceremony? And yeah, like what do you think of all that sort of stuff now as well? Oh, I'm an I'm a avid supporter of plant medicine. I think, you know, the, the reverence that I, that I have inside for plant medicine um, and specifically, specifically for Madre Ayahuasca, um, which is, which is two uh, plants that are put together uh, from the Amazon jungle and it grows now in the jungle um, and they make the concoction ayahuasca. Um, and I can honestly say that she, she, she completely shifted my whole life, you know. Um, I'm so, so grateful to, to the plants uh, and specifically to, to ayahuasca for, for that. Um, and yeah, I just, I just think that what happened for me is um, I, I went through three journeys when I came to Costa Rica and uh, I basically in a sequence of seven days. So I sat with the medicine for, for three ceremonies in seven days. And, and I can honestly say that the first, the first uh, ceremony that I sat in, I kind of didn't really, was like, I wasn't able to fathom what was taking place because um, it was it was all the colors of the rainbow in one one night, you know. Um, um, in a lot of ways, horrific and and um, tumultuous um, in terms of seeing the different acts that had taken place in the past, the things that I put into my body, um, different uh, different the ways that I treated people. Um, um, uh, aspects of my life where I wasn't kind of aligned with truth that were being exposed and coming up. And so, so the medicine on that first night definitely started to show me some of the things that I, as an individual human being that I had to work on. And, uh, but, but as I say, like the, the, I, I went to do it with a, a, a Peruvian shaman, a lady. And, um, she said to me on the first night, she said, keep the medicine inside of you. So she basically said that for keep it inside, keep the medicine inside of you. And um, I didn't have any uh, purging or anything on the first two ceremonies that I went to. But it, as I say, it was all the colors of the rainbow. It's like also another thing, trying to describe the, you know, trying to describe the infinite. It's, it's really difficult, but, but, um, you know, things that happened within the night, like for instance, her at, at a stage, her, her whole being, she turned into a shamanic lineage of all of these healers that came through her. And she's obviously been in a lineage of shaman woman and family that for generations. Mm -hmm. And what the medicine actually did, it allowed me to see her whole lineage through her. And what actually happened is she turned into this old, old, old lady. And through the journey, I, you know, you struggle at times through the journey because it's, there's, there's, there's um, energetic uh, pockets within the body that get, kind of the energy gets stagnant and stuck. And what the medicine does is it goes in there and it kind of scans. And when it comes to a stuck, it's like kind of a stuck um, part of energy, it, it basically goes in there and what normally happens is that you, you have some form of release, whether that's like you go to the bathroom or you, you purge or you start crying or you start laughing or, 
and so these kind of moments take place um, specifically if you've you know had 15 years of of accumulating um you know um adding to to your system and um when when it actually gets in there it kind of scans that and it sees where where the light needs to go and it goes in there and then it breaks that apart and and it does that within the whole body and so yeah so for me on the first two journeys i was kind of getting introduced to her and uh yeah i mean all the um ikaros like the different uh, indigenous um patterns and visions and things that came through it but um as i said the first night she came and i was going through a real hard process like because it, it's like a lot of information that comes up and especially i think if you haven't been doing any work on yourself um the more things are exposed um and brought to light and so so this 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 came up for me and and i was going through a really hard passage and so she came over to me and she's it's like she was sprinkling this floral water on me but so this floral water actually it it touched me and it hit me in the the like the inside of my eyelid yeah and honestly it is like a re recalibration of my brain in some way i i felt that i felt that um that the way that i've been living for so many years um in the space of one evening um was already being shifted um into more of my true self and um so as i say so the it got, i got to that third ceremony and i'd been holding everything inside and i had this one brother that was with me for the three nights and he was next to me and he just said to me get it out joe get it out <laughs> and i was like i've been holding this thing in for 15 years of my life probably 20 years of my life and um and i went outside and as i got outside i just like this monster purge came and i just and it was literally like I was running from all the orifices, you know, like this sludge, basically. And um, and I just remember, like, after that purge, I remember getting up, and one of the um, w one of the servers that was there, he came over to me and he just said, "You are the light. You are the light, mm. brother. You are the light." And I realized in that moment that all of the things that had happened in the last twenty years of my life, I was, I was by the grace of god i was put into the situation to experience um this medicine and i was i was given the opportunity to in that moment thank every single human being that had affected my life in a positive way that had that had influenced me and that had given me love and um and i was able to to really see the universe for the first time and um yeah I'll never forget that moment it's it's like a it's almost like a revelation you know when when you when you when you have a moment like that mm. and so powerful you've had, that you've had two just in your in your journey so far like two big spiritual awakenings there was that your was that part of your pain of losing your dad was that purging some of that of course as well oh uh, yeah no doubt you know as I said, Craig, those, the, the, the three ceremonies, I think that what the shaman was really was, because what she did is she identified that I probably was carrying a lot and just energetically, you know, mm. we, 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 we absorb so many different things into our being, you know, and that whether that's through what we eat or, or just energetically, you know, and so over all those years, the trauma of, of my dad, I, I, I don't think I truly dealt with it ever, you know, up until the, that point when I was able to see that this, these um, aspects of my life were being affected and that this trauma had been embedded in my consciousness. And it was mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing it for what it is for the first time. And when that happens, it's like, it's a massive, it's an awakening, but it's like an epiphany because you're like, Oh damn, you know? And I literally like, after that monster purge, I was standing on the grass and I was just like, thank you, God. <laughs> you know, wow. like, thank you so much for bringing me wow. to this moment. I was in tears and I was just like, I, I, I can't believe I've been brought to this moment and I'm so grateful. And I, and I just wanted to send love to all my brothers and my sisters and, 
mm. and get peace with 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 myself too i think that's another key thing is like she shows us what presence is but also self-love how important is self-love like to actually love yourself you know like because if you truly can love yourself and not be hard on yourself and you know we all get hard on ourselves sometimes but it's like that true love is such a key i think to uh, so much healing yeah, yeah okay. i wanted to ask briefly like before we move on from that is like i think there's something in the west uh that people have a hard time understanding or grasping the idea of a of a shaman right and what that really is and sort of the ikaros that that these people are uh singing to 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 you know these are very foreign things to people and these ayahuascaras and and these people like what is what is that like what is a shaman and like how does that the family family lineage like it just sounds like to a lot of people i think very very foreign you know what i mean like it's a very strange idea that we can tap into generational uh sort of uh, genetics and things like that through medicine uh, yeah. and through these people can you just maybe just tell us a little bit about what is a shaman okay yeah so for me basically uh i'm fortunate enough to be in this valley we work with a with a a really really heart-centered shaman and you know someone that is is you know a bearer of this medicine Mm. and someone who's working within the light but like with the highest integrity you know um it's not based upon like money or it's not based upon superficial things materialistic things obviously we know in the in this world um there's there's dark shamans too and there's you know there's the duality of the two that exist and so for me um, central, central and most important point is the truth. Is that being living a heart-centered, uh, heart-centered life? And are they coming from the true place? And I think that a lot of people are getting into medicine circles and to um, being drawn to the medicine, but not necessarily sitting with someone who's, um, you know, uh, living the the life that they are are speaking if that makes sense it's like the the everything is aligned the thoughts the words and the deeds the thoughts words and actions are all aligned in truth and for me that's a that's a crucial point because if if i'm not aligned and say i'm not aligned i'll keep i'm i i won't be living out you know it will be it will be uh, disfigured in a way and that energy, energy you can feel, and us, and I think that it's vital, 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 vital that that people that are working with this medicine, and I, I can just talk for for my own experience, but but I know that on a day to day basis, um, you know these these the, the shaman that I've been working with um, is living every single day of his life um, in a humble way in a truthful way and uh and yeah and uh, and i think that um they are carriers of the medicine but allowing uh for the medicine to really uh do the work you know and then um i i see myself as someone who's in support of that process of someone who's in support of this uh support of this medicine because this medicine is like it's one of the keys to waking up eh? um maybe on on the evolutional path it's a um it's a, a stepping stone to awakening to you know your highest potential uh to that limitlessness that is within each and every single one of us is is through that medicine there's no doubt in my mind and um and it's funny because sometimes in those ceremonies you know you can see even your mind will start to come up with the judging mind will come up and there'll be a moment in the ceremony once you've had two cups of medicine it'll be like it'll be this pop again and and the mind will suddenly be seen for what it is and when i say the mind it's like that part of the mind the psychological mind that has something to say about others or you know the judging mind that kind of 
that kind of energy. And you can actually see the story going and then all of a sudden, boom, pop, and then it's into the heart. And, and from that space, you know, all form of creation and beauty and um, is, is possible. But it's so, it's so cool to hear you speak about these things. Seriously, it's like, it's really, really important, you know, and it removes any kind of like stigma that, you know, people might have. And, and it is silly that we kind of have these stigmas. Mm. Um, yeah, but I, I actually had, a, had an experience myself when I was in Peru many years ago, about seven years ago uh, yeah. with ayahuasca and a shaman. And it was like, I mean, I can't say it was life changing because I, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't understand it maybe well enough at the time, but like the experience was phenomenal, you know, and I do think it opened me up to, to changing the trajectory of my life because I did come back um, uh, from that whole trip in South America with a kind of new look and a new uh, lease on life basically. So um, it really is, yeah, it really is like, I guess life changing then, you know, if I, if I look at it like that, um, so it's cool to hear that you, you know, you, you're doing these things and you're talking about them and, you know, that, that encourages other people as well to start exploring these things because there is so much power, uh, in medicine. Um, and we're finding that out more and more and more, you know, like guys doing, you know, like sort of mushrooms and all these other plants as well. And I think it's great that this is coming into the, you know, kind of mainstream, like even things like CBD and whatnot. And I think that, uh, you know, the more we can connect with nature, and realize who we are and what we are, the better. Like, you know, we just, like that disconnection that we feel like we've had over the, I don't know, maybe the last hundred or so years has kind of left us in a strange place. And um, it's good that guys like you, you know, these big powerful kind of um, mentors are kind of going there um, because it gives other people permission to do the same. So, so true, Gareth. Um I, I think that also what, what shifts it a lot is that, you know, also sometimes we want to claim or we want to, there's a part of us that maybe want to feel special, you know, and I, I also see that, that, that uh, with this medicine, that when we come to the medicine, it's like we're coming to a master. Um, you know, uh, I really feel that. And that, you know, the name Santo Dame is actually the master that gives. So it's like Santa Dame is the church that this medicine was, has been brought in, onto the planet through, the, through this church and then into the West. And it's just a matter of like the reverence that we show up to these things, you know, and we see them as sacred because a lot of times in the West, like maybe people are thinking that they want an experience or they want to shift their reality or they want to, they want to um, explore a different plane of consciousness which is, which is a beautiful thing, but it's, it's very integral and key to say that the way that we show up to these things in a sacred way, if we can, if we can enter with that kind of mindset and then with humility, then she can show us this world and beyond into the, you know, into the next dimension, uh, dimensions of, of, of reality, you know, and, and I think that, that that for me is absolutely a, a key point is that that we show up to these things with the reverence that they are, you know, um, the reverence that, that, that we show up to these medicines with is crucial. Um, and then, you know, because I mean, I see it. I see people that they want to maybe have an experience and then they... They may get medicine off the internet. They mix the, the, the vine with the, they mix it together and then they administer the medicine. But, you know, it's not in a space that's being, um, that's a sacred space that's being held specifically for this kind of journey. So it, it can be really dangerous too if, if, you know, people are just going on the internet and getting uh, the ingredients and mixing it and then thinking, oh, I'm going to just have an experience, you know, without like uh, Craig said, without the guidance of a, of a shaman who, who's been working with that medicine, who's in reverence to the medicine, who's humble, um, and that's working in the light. Um, I think that people that want to be exposed and they, they have this inner search for, for that, I think that is 
totally crucial to be in that kind of setting for them to be able to go through their processes and then whatever needs to come up, whatever trauma is stuck that needs to be seen, um, that they can be guided in these, these ceremonies and that, that I think where, where we are in the valley, where we're doing these sacred circle ceremonies is, is what I feel is that there's a sequence to it and then what that sequence is, is music, fire, silence, music, fire, silence, music, fire, silence. And in between, in interims, there's the, the drinking of the medicine. But the, the space is held with the highest integrity. There's, there's, a, there's sacred energy. The shaman is completely aligned. And then the helpers, the people that are serving, um, they too are there with compassionate hearts and wanting to uh, serve and be part of that and, and help people wake up. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's like we are, get stuck in, in realities that are not true. And the minute that we, this medicine touches, it's like, it's like the blood of the earth, you know, the blood of Mother Earth. It, like, whoop, it goes in there, crystallize, transformize the the core of who we are and allow us to be like, this is who I am. You know, this story, this personal story, the drama that's playing out on a daily basis, that's not who I am, but like, this is who I am. So emerging in that and being able to be with that for whether that's for eight hours or five hours, whatever it may be, it just allows us to really be. You know, it's fascinating there, Joe, is it's, it's so, I think this is such an important piece of the story because medicine and these plant medicines in general are becoming more popular, right? They, they are becoming, they are work, sort of working their way as they should into the mainstream. However, so more and more people are going to be sort of dabbling and thinking about this. So I think it's really cool that you're discussing this kind of thing is that, that reverence, as you mentioned, and I think part of this is an interesting piece for me is like part of sort of plant medicine is the dissolution of your ego, right? That that's, that's power, you know, like that's where that's, this is the weird part is like finding that self sovereignty is so important, but it has to come through a place of very low ego or, or little ego. So I think people can't come into this kind of stuff with a, with a, with an ego mindset, you know what I mean? And I think that's the, I think people, first of all, if you know that you're already halfway there because the ego is going to be dissolved if you do this stuff correctly and you need to be okay with it. And that's really hard for us to be ripped apart from our so-called story and identity. So I think that's, I think this is a really important piece that you're sharing. So thanks. Thanks for doing that work because I think that's going to make the difference to create the connections we need to create through this medicine and through these, um, through this journey, this heart space and heart centered journey, you know? Oh, it's great. Yeah. man, it's giving me goosebumps when you say that because it's almost like if you have the call and you step up and you are in one of these ceremonies and you come there with the, you know, the transformation that I've seen, that uh, it's <laughs> not just in my own life, but like, mm the transformation that takes place, it's, it's, it's got to be one of the best feelings in the world. When you see someone and they come to your front doorstep and they, you know, they, there's a lot of ego and it's like, oh, you can feel the ego, you know, you can really feel it's got a tinge to it. It's just like, Ooh, what's this thing now? What's this person coming? And you know, it's like, Oh, I know this. And I'm like, Oh, this thing. And so when I see that coming, it's, it's fascinating because it's like, okay, they arrive here at Ram Organica Healing Sanctuary, but you can feel the energy and it's, it's, it's just what it is. It's, it's us. It's our, our evolution. You know, more yeah. to the truth. So, so when I witness that and then I watch them, I watch the transformation. Mm -hmm. I can honestly tell you, <laughs> it is the best. I'm like, the, the humility that it brings, you know, like, People go through these journeys and, and they're after, like they may have come there like, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and like holding on to this identity of who they are, or I'm a businessman, or I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm 
next thing. They get to the medicine. They go through a night. <laughs> the next day, like, it may have been horrific for them and they may have been like, sure, what's happening to me, you know? But <laughs> as the sequence goes on, and a lot of times the people are sitting through like a seven-day retreat, so they'll go through three, kind of three sessions with the medicine. So by the end of the week, it's like life transformation, you know, whole life transformation. It's, it's incredible to witness that. And I, and I truly... I truly feel blessed to be able to hold space and, and witness beings go through these processes because, you know, as you say, it can be very terrifying because it's like we don't know, like, the unexpected, you know. It's kind of, it's almost a little bit like death in a way too. Mm. It's this, un, it's like we don't know what to expect and the medicine is so mysterious that mm. you can't actually put point on it and that's why it's so hard it's like talking about the changeless or the infiniteness of of our being it's really difficult to talk about because it's like how do you explain the infinite and how do you you know go into these things so but i can honestly say like the transformation that i've witnessed have been the biggest blessings and someone may come in there with like a chip on the shoulder and be like uh, this is who I am and I don't really want to change. And, you know, things aren't going to change. And then the medicine goes in there and the love <laughs> gets, this person gets surrounded by love and it's difficult. Don't get me wrong. It's like sometimes you have these screeches and it's like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm losing, I'm losing, I'm losing a part of myself. But you know, that part of yourself that you're losing, it's actually the biggest blessing. And then by the end of the week, these people are like, smiling you know just wow. <laughs> not talking just silent and, <laughs> and it's like yes <laughs> uh, it's like an i think it's just in it's a good thing just to chat briefly before we talk a bit more about the the ego as you're talking about is like consciousness itself is pure and what you said earlier in our conversation about am i even male am i even, you know this is just a vehicle through this thing that if you connect it to source, what does that mean? And that, that is pure. That's really, really pure. And then, then you sort of tag this ego on, which becomes, so you say, hey, Joe, you say to me, Hey Craig, who are you? And I say, Oh, I'm a chiropractor, but is that me? You know, is that what you were saying earlier? And that's just my ego. And I think what you were saying earlier about this journey through this, absolute tearing apart of yourself and your ego when you come to the medicine or medicine comes to you that's something that people need to be prepared for as well and i think when you're approaching as you said with absolute reverence and humility when you come to these ceremonies and with with medicine i think people have to understand maybe that they need to be prepared for their ego to be uh cracked open and you might and, and as you said earlier as well there's a certain death happening Mm. and maybe that's partially of your ego and that's really hard because then you might end up with more questions than answers and that's beautiful too isn't it oh yeah no doubt i think it's like it's also as you said earlier it's like this illusion of the ego you know it's like we're basically like dissolving all of these layers you know and that is associated to me it's like It's from all the past conditioning, from all of these things that we've picked up over the years, um, maybe certain traumas, things that are kind of holding us back. And it's almost like there's in this, it's a bundle that's there, you know, that we, that we accumulate over the time. And it's kind of like, I always keep like saying like, wake up now, (laughs) you know, (laughs) don't wait, please don't wait, please don't wait. Because the longer you wait, the more you keep adding and adding and adding, the harder it is for us to then dissolve. And I think that that's for me is also a key. I mean, obviously we're all, if you believe in reincarnation and these things where, you know, we, we've done certain deeds in past lives that allow us to get to these points of realization. And, and, um, and then obviously we're all on the same path, the pathless path towards the recognition of our true place. But it's like, there's so many, um, there's so many different, it's like that. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, that analogy of like from 12 to six and say like, 
the people that are at 12 are the ones that are becoming more and more awake. Mm. And then it works its way down to six where you've got the people that are like still asleep, you know, and there's no um, judgment around that. It's just the way of the universe. Like we wake up at different stages mm. in our lives. And I don't know where I'm sure that's related to like our past lives or lives where that we've lived in the past that not even in this specific life that where we've done good deeds um, and the opposite can be said where we haven't done the right things. But I would like to truly believe that we are all working towards that 12 o'clock, you know, that mm. even if we think we're not, even if it's the guy that's going down to the pub, having dorps with his mates, even that man is coming perhaps closer to the 12 o'clock, you know, in his path. And, and, um, and so, yeah, so what the medicine allows for me is it like allows for an acceleration of that. It allows for us to wake up, but wake up with a lot of, can be a lot of pain at times, you know, like any separation, any loss of identity of the thought of who I am can be painful. It's like, Oh, I thought I was this for 15 years of my life. Now what am I going to do? You know, like it's kind of, it can be frightening. It can be um, tumultuous in your, in your, in your existence. Like how, like, I don't know. What are you talking about? Like, no, this is who I am. So once you've gone through the process and you start to like the, the medicine is one thing, of course, like um, Gareth mentioned earlier too, about, you know, going, into the medicine and, and, and it allowing him, it's showing him different parts of his life where he can maybe make small adjustments and things like that. And then go on to things like, you know, meditation or a daily practice of yoga or, you know, um, any other form of practice that can calm the mind, allow us to live more from our hearts. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that process, no one said it's easy. Who wants to look at your shit? Who wants to look at your, 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 your shadow side. Mm. No, no one wants to particularly bring all those things to light and say, Oh, I've been a bad boy, you know, kind of thing. But it's like, but for me, there's so much in that journey. There's like, there's, there's chies, you know, mm, mm, there's like mm. you drop in and you say, Hey, boy, key. okay. Now I want to see who's looking in the mirror. Who's here, you know? And, and, Am I, am I going to allow myself to, to see this? Am I going to allow myself to, to transcend? And through the grace of God, because as you said before, all of this, I feel through the grace of God, we have been fortunate enough and blessed enough to just be here right now to even talk about this. Mm. And, and I always, I, I, I've got this, I feel like it's an energetic kind of expansion in a way when mind comes and it wants to claim like something, when it wants to say like, I'm the doing this. It's in that moment there, we have a choice. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, when we are about to claim the thing, if we can have enough um, presence to be able to just observe that thought, and release it, but not claim, our energy field just goes boom. It opens up. It's, it must be for me a law of nature because when we don't identify, it's like that ego becomes narrow. Like, the, you, you know, you can, I don't know if you, like, I'm sure, like, we've all experienced this, but like, you can smell when it's like very strong, like a lot of conditioning and a lot of, and, and you can almost feel like it's, it's kind of a narrow, narrow, it's narrow. But then for me, when, when we evolve and when we are able to open, it's like this just takes us into a whole different plane of consciousness. And it's like, we are that. And then it's like, okay, thank you. And then you can just bathe in that. And it's like so much joy, mm -hmm. so much love, so much peace, all of the, all of the, you know, the essences of the soul are, mm. are, are brought out. Mm. And then, you know, then, then your daily habits, your, you know, everything in your life, like just shifts. It's like mm. 
you can't do what you've been doing for 10 years because it's like, okay, cool. I can't do this anymore because your, your consciousness is like, what are you doing, bro? Like you may, you may even do it. You may even think, oh, okay, I'm going to go and have some drink. I'm going to have a drink, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm going to go and have a drink, go and have a drink. And then it's like, oh, okay, I wake up the next day and I'm like, okay, wasn't that great, you know? And so through that process um, and through humility, like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unbelievable journey that we're on, you know? Mm-hmm. For sure, my man. Well, but thanks for sharing all of that. And I'm really glad that, you know, your heart has been cracked open um, because you express a lot of love and it's, it's extremely powerful, man. Um, so, so just, uh, just kind of as we, I guess, coming to the end of our chat, uh, it would be nice to know uh, about uh, Rama Organica, the, the healing sanctuary that you, you run in Costa Rica. So maybe you can just tell us, you know, a little bit about that, but in the kind of experiences and things that you hold there. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we're originally where it was an organic farm that we acquired uh, four years ago. And as I say, it's in the center of this valley that we live in, and it's called the Diamante Valley, which is like the Diamond Valley, basically. Behind us, we have um, these exceptional caves, um, places where we, they hold space uh, ceremonies and do different kind of hiking adventures and different things. And we're up in the mountains. We're about 25 minutes from the Pacific Ocean. And um, we, we started, we, start, we bought the land uh, four years ago. And three and a half years ago, we, we converted it into a healing sanctuary. And so the, the thing what we have been doing is we, we have um, different accommodations on the land. We have a natural swimming hole that's like this beautiful Salamanca mountain water that comes from the source of mother nature and it's so cleansing it's so revitalizing and the nature the birds the the amount of bird species that i've seen there it's 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 epic man like i honestly i haven't seen birds like that before but but um then what happens is we have different facilitators that come uh, and hold space and they basically share their gifts and uh, we hold space. We have a team that holds space for them and then make sure that everything's good. It's sometimes it's breath work. Sometimes it's meditation. Sometimes it's um, yoga, sometimes plant medicines. And what actually happens is we bring these facilitators through. A lot of these people have been serving in this way for 20 years, like helping people find their true self, helping people um, connect with nature um, be in an environment that allows for that to to take place. So, so that's also another aspect of of what that is. And then farm to table. So we do like organic food straight from the source, straight to the table. For organic food straight to the table. So that's what happens when the guests uh, mostly. And when we can't find from the garden, then we get from the local uh, market, which is also all organic produce. So, so it's really that's the the kind of the frequency that we set there and then also just around truth, you know, it's that, I think that's where, what it's about. And, um, Mm -hmm. um, and now the name is Rama Organica, which actually finally, funny enough and coincidentally Rama was a, was a God uh, on earth 5,000 years ago and is an incarnation of uh, Krishna which is like in Indian mythology, like some of the Greek uh, gods, um, Rama was like an enlightened being that uh, in those times through the golden age, like everyone was enlightened. So there was no like me, 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 me. It was just everyone was enlightened. And there's a whole mythology and story that goes into that. But through my spiritual practices, I was drawn to that mythology and uh, and really drawn to Rama and subsequently got a couple of mantras that I was given by the spiritual teacher, Amma, um, when she came to visit in Toulon. Uh, she actually gave me a, a mantra that was uh, from Rama. So mm. it's like, so that, and that very powerful mantra, um, basically it's, it's, uh, 
it's about it's about dropping into the heart and living you know from from truth and living your life in that way and and so that so the place represents that for me um and then obviously organic organic life um uh and sorry so the coincidence was with rama is that in costa rican in spanish not costa rican spanish the name rama is a branch so mm -hmm. it's like Branch. Sometimes the Costa Rican people are like branch organica, like <laughs> organica. You know, like, hey, just look at your Indian mythology and you'll get it. You know, but but um, but it's it's yeah, it's it's a beautiful. It was it's been a beautiful, beautiful project. I'm so blessed. The people, uh, the people that have supported my partner, the side that supported me so much over the years, and uh, and yeah, it's it it's it was a it's been a massive learning curve, you know, just like on all fronts. Um, we, you know, if I did it again, I'd do it in a different way. I'll be honest, but, mm. but, um, yeah, a lot, we lost a lot on the way, um, financially, uh, and also, yeah, it's, it's quite a stressful thing becoming a, <laughs> an owner of an organic farm. And specifically once you start with the personnel and the laws mm. and regulations in Costa Rica and, you know, I, I really like kind of threw myself in the deep end of it, but, but, you know, if you can't swim, you can't, <laughs> you can't get to the side. So I kind of, I kind of just went that way and, and uh, I've learned a ton, you know, like through the process. And I just say that people that are looking to make that change in their lives, um, I would say, if you're looking to move to somewhere like Costa Rica, go there, live there. You know, rent a place for 400 bucks or whatever. Just go there, live this, immerse in the culture, vibe with the locals, get to know the whole place first before you dive in and go and buy and go crazy mm -hmm. in that way. You know what I mean? So I think that sharing that information and then just the lost in translation, all the, the Spanish, um, it's been like for a South African <laughs> burki. <laughs> <laughs> for a South African Burki to go to France, learn French, and then come to Costa Rica, learn some Spanglish, and then like kind of nav navigate your way through. <laughs> and it's so interesting when we get because we've had like French guests come, you know, and it's it's like they arrive, and I'm like uh, bonjour, you know? <laughs> but but it's like when when we get to the the, the like deeper into the conversation it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> kind of interesting because i see how the brain it like it really because especially if you've been trying to learn a language like spanish and you you completely committed to learning it and then french comes and you know this language and it's like becomes foreign too and it's kind of like <laughs> brain explosion oh, like funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it sounds absolutely amazing and you know whenever you dive you know, head first into things, you, there's something so beautiful about that is like the, the lessons that you learn along that way are just invaluable. Even just like Gareth and I was doing a podcast, you know, like it just seems kind of small. It's, it's comparatively obviously what you're doing, but like all the little things you just pick up and, and all these little new, like realizations that you have about yourself. And it's such a great thing that you're doing. And, and also you're adding so much value. So, so thanks for that. But just sort of to bring this home, uh, Joe, like, what are maybe two bits of advice that you can offer people listening to this um, that have sort of helped you in your life? Maybe that you could just share that with us. I think the, 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 some of the biggest things is like when we shift into our spiritual life is that we don't, you know, obviously, like we said before, we're all on different trajectories in a way of like, like consciously where we are, but like, when you when you shift into another reality of like what you do for a sense is like even if i'm becoming like the monk or uh, you know is like to really be aware of your mind and to be aware of like what's the story that's being played and like whether you're doing that genuinely from your heart or whether it's just something that's coming from a want to be somebody you know like and i found that with the spiritual practice is that that um you know, carrying from rugby, you know, that's very much an ego, like, in a way, it's like a lot of ego, because if you don't, 
stand up then you get knocked down kind of thing and you've got to keep going and it's like it builds resilience but taking it's very easy to go from like the rugby player that's got quite a lot of ego straight into spiritual practice with the same ego and want to mm. be some great spiritual teacher and all of this stuff so mm. i think for the biggest lesson that i've learned on this path up until now is that the, the moment that we realize that we are just vessels for this infinite energy to flow through and when we clean the vessel we are able to be aligned and we allow for more of that current to come through us and then what the key to it for me is is to expanding that further is to being able to identify when i want to be claim my claim this you know and say that it's me doing this you know or it's me having this podcast and it's me that's done all these things no it isn't it's the spirit that's working through me <laughs> you know what i mean and the minute that we allow ourselves to like realize that then that drops the the whole like story you know and that story that we have playing in our minds um it, it, it's really not that important, you know? But as you say, as you say, what I wanted to say to you both is that, you know, this platform that you've created, I've seen, I've seen a ton of um, influential beings coming on here and you both allowing for that to, for them to blossom and for them to share their stories. I think storytelling is, is, is such a powerful tool, you know, um, in terms of connecting and real connection with, with human beings. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it gives us, it gives us something where we can like relate to someone in, 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 in to another being. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing that you both are doing. And I, and I, and I think that like, however we think, whatever we think is like irrelevant because this is just expands, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so so this this is that's wonderful. Thank you, man. That that means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Man. And and but just tell us before Gareth asks us, you sort of the last question. Um, you know, what are you what are you excited about moving forward uh in your journey and um also what have you got coming up and also where people can get in touch with you and, and come down and, and see you there? It's weird because the last couple of months I just came back onto social media and like a like a personal way, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's like, it's been interesting that whole process, but I think anyone can reach out through Rama Organica at gmail.com. That's, that's the, the best way to reach us. If you want to come out for a journey or you're looking to, you know, get to Costa Rica and visit the Southern Pacific zone and, and come to Rama. Uh, it's a very loving community and, uh, and uh, and yeah, and supportive in a lot of ways. The community actually here is is a big big blessing to to the planet, and also just the work that people are doing in their own spheres. You know, very powerful people, beings that are doing different things in their own spheres for planet Earth, and also for you know, in respect to Mother Nature, um, and you're yeah, just holding it down in that way. So so much reverence for all of them for and this goes to everyone that's kind of connecting with nature because i got that really big hit yesterday that you know nature you know we've we've taken it to the limits and beyond you know with 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 where we are with that and i think that if anything that politicians people in power should really really start considering like to the, from the bottom of my heart, like considering like what's going on on the planet right now and what are we giving to our nourishment, our mother, because it, it's become more evident for me that, that our generations, our kids, people that, people that are coming after us, it's not even necessarily us, but we don't want to be known as the, 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 you know, who even knows if we continue going this way, you know, then it is necessary for everyone to die. And, and I mean, die to your ego because, because if that's coming, it's coming. You know, Pachamama will swallow us all up. It's happened in past civilizations. It will happen. That's why it, the, the, the primordial thing for me is like communion with, with, 
with spirit and and uh, and with nature nature is spirit but it's like just all of that in total reverence to to her and like Let's please our politicians and people that are making the calls and doing these things. Please, like, let's let's really give an impetus to to more to that. And as as a collective consciousness too, we 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 all need to be concerned about that. And 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 if it's like a small act, if it means like just shifting in a small way, one hour or one one act, that's all that it takes. It's better than nothing. So, so it's interesting with everything that's been going on now with no cars and uh, no, nothing on the road and nothing on the streets. It's like, it's interesting how Pachamama, Mother Nature is like rejuvenating. Mm. And uh, I mean, I think it's a sign, no? Like mm. all these animals coming into the city and like the smog clearing up um, other than the satellites that have been put in <laughs> <laughs> now. But, <laughs> But, but it's like, you know, like there, there has to be optimism and hope, but, but like we also have to be realistic. And if our politicians and the people making decisions don't wake up to that reality, then what's happened to our generations after us? Mm. You know, it's like, are the, is, is it going to be, what's it going to look like in 20 years, you know? Yeah, but I couldn't agree more. And I think... You know, even to kind of uh, take it like a, to a, a bit of a different level, but exactly what you just said as well. Like we almost can't wait for the politicians. Like we are the ones that need to make these decisions, you know, like collectively, like you said, if we all start doing something in a good way, you know, or stop doing something that's not that good, like together, we have the power to to really shift things you know, shift things around and change things up. And it actually does start to this, you know, and maybe one of the side things is, is you do have these discussions with the politicians because they need to sort stuff out and whatnot. But uh, if we just start with our own actions, then, then that kind of kicks things off nicely, I reckon. Yeah. Um, and, and sorry to tie into that, just like, I, I'm well aware, like we, you know, like when you, we, we, when you cleansed in a lot of ways, you become aware and you can see through the veil. So whoever's taking charge of planet earth right now, I beg and I plea with you, please, whether if you are a human being and you are ridiculously human, like you will act and you will shift and there will be shifts and there will be changes because, and for the better, because we have to really take into consideration, like, and as well as what I'm saying is like, yeah, I say politicians, they may be the ones, the front face that are seemingly making the decisions, but whoever's behind them, please, I beg you, make, the, make that decision to look after our planet because our planet needs us in any way. Like you said, Garrett, like small acts, like something small in a day can make a big difference. You know, if every single human becomes conscious about that and that our children, we need, they need to also prosper. They need to have abundance too. You know, it's not just about us. And so the protection of pieces of land and protection of parts on earth that, that really need us to be protected, I think there should be law in place where these places become like natural reserves or they become like sanctuaries where those places cannot be touched for material gain for whatever they're searching for minerals resource oil whatever they cannot be touched and that should be a fact because we the, the earth right now needs places like this you know like it's keeping things in balance if we didn't have that what would planet earth look like right now mm. this is the reason why i think plant medicine where that can really step up to the plate and if these politicians had their egos obliterated just once in their life, they might make a small five degree change in their trajectory. Um, and you know, like that's where people can really reconnect to themselves and nature. And I think sometimes you need that, that strong medicine to do that for some people because they, they, they don't want to put the effort in necessarily in meditating every day. But I think these are tools that we can use in the right way 
to really shift that thinking around these things for the, for the change makers, you know, hopefully that's, that's kind of, but, but the collective first has to go there and then, you know, hopefully it trickles down or trickles up to these people, you know? Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. I think that, you know, like you see powerful people engaging in, in the right circles with this medicine, you're going to see like massive shifts, mm. you know? And yeah. it's powerful people with a lot of like virtual cash or virtual money that, that can make masses of difference in this world. And so the medicine for me is like, that's a, that's a given, like that medicine is so sacred and, and so mm. important in terms of like the awakening of the planet. I mean, I think just energetically, like the earth itself is also you know, I don't know, like I've heard that like a while back. I heard that a lot, like quite a long time ago that like the frequency of the earth is like there's an elevation that's like it's almost saying, okay, like we need to wake up now because it's, it's, it's gone to that point where if we look around and we see what's being done uh, on earth, it's like it's crazy. It's like that was another thing is like I watched some of news yesterday. I watched like 15 minutes of news. And it's, it's almost so bizarre and so crazy that my mind is not able to, from all the different realities that are taking place and all the different stories, I'm not able to, to come to any point because it's like it's, it can't, I can't fathom it in my mind. It's like the unfathomable in my mind. I, I, and that's a good thing because <laughs> if I was going to try to figure this out, <laughs> we'd be here for days, man. <laughs> <Be> like, <laughs> so it's allowing us to be like in our hearts and like, just be like, you know what? Spirit is with us. Like do your work, continue practicing sittings, being still, um, focusing on, on, on Pachamama and on nature and, and, and really like giving in that way. And then, you know, who knows, like maybe that consciousness of mother earth will, will awaken everyone to that point where we'll be like, okay, we've hit that point now, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure, bud. There's so much in there, bud. And I mean, yes, I would love to, to, I think we're going to have to do round two, to be honest with you, because there's, there, there's so much that we, that we have to have to speak about, but, um, but, but maybe we can just finish off with our last question, which is, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Um, you know, I saw that, I saw that, uh, posted in the questionnaire and I, and I kind of, I kind of, it brought me to a, another point. Are we human beings having a spiritual experience or are we spiritual beings having a human experience? So it's kind of like, okay, it puts it out there for me. If you say to me, what's ridiculously human being like? It's about feeling. It's about feeling the emotions that come up. It's about realizing that we are human. And that, that, they, they, that, you know, if something isn't done in the right way, you know, be kind with yourself, be gentle, because this is the path that we're all on as brothers and sisters. And, and being ridiculously human for me means that, you know, you really are um, kind of tasting what it means to be human. <laughs> beautiful <bro>. love it <laughs> love it, love it. Yeah, yes. yeah even just saying that it like made me just think about it you know what yeah. am i <laughs> um so that's that's super cool but like seriously man i just wanted to just say like a massive thanks for coming on the podcast seriously joe like um you you really just gave us so much to think about you know and wow. um i think that is so important because having people like yourself, you know, who have like reached these sort of like high levels of, um, you know, humanity where, where you respected and, um, you know, to, to come to where you are now, you know, you, you're totally, 
um, just to me, you, you seem like this kind of like Messiah, but not just like in your presence, but in your look, seriously. And, and, and because you're talking about things that are like not necessarily mainstream yet, I think that is extremely powerful. And it gives people the permission to also be curious, you know, to go out there and be curious and, and ask the questions and maybe sort of dabble and experiment and do these things as well. And, um, yeah, like you speak with so much wisdom, but like, seriously, like, wow. I, th like Craig said as well, he said there was moments in the chat where it was like goosebumps and you're just <laughs> listening to you speak with, with goosebumps and it's, and it's a mixture of many things. It's a mixture of what you're talking about. It's a mixture of how you talk about it and how you hold yourself in the space that you hold as well. And yeah, but, um, it, it's been like such a privilege to speak with you and, um, to just connect with you. And, and this, this sounds really ridiculous, right? Like really ridiculous. But like, if I take myself back to uh, probably 25 years ago now, like um, what coming to Kez on a Saturday afternoon, like I had, I'd never, I don't think I ever met you or anything in my whole entire life. I just knew of you. Right. And, and you had a presence back then. And I was like, yes, this one day, I would dig to be able to flip and speak to that Oak or whatever. And, and I'm not joking. Like this is literally like how I felt back then. And now all these years later, that's kind of like come around full circle now, but, and I'm now like talking to an Oak, I kind of flip and admired and, oh. and, and I, but I admire you in a different level now, but it's just like, it's a much deeper, different way, you know, than I, than I, than I thought it might've been back then. So, so thank you for that, but thank you for being oh. there for, for me as just a guy like and and i really yeah it's it's really important and powerful for me so so thanks for everything and the chat and everything of course so you're a legend bloke oh i guess i you know i felt like the energy from the get-go like from you you know and and now actually connecting with craig as well i see what a beautiful team you both are and it's like i as, as, as you said, like it gave me goosebumps because, you know, it's, it's incredible in this life how, how we come full circle, you know, and I mean, there's even songs. It's like we come full circle again, you know, and we come full circle again. And, and like to connect in this way, I, 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 I just want to say I feel blessed to be able to connect in this way on this platform because it's super, super vital for whoever may be able to listen and be able to tap in and maybe in their path, it can help them or shift something in their life where maybe they, they don't, they don't know what to do or they don't know how to, how to evolve from that point. And maybe this, this chat that we had, maybe that can inspire them or give them some hope or something within it just to know that, you know, everything that we perceive to be like really difficult in our lives will always afterwards you always turn out and you look back and you think to yourself wow that was really hard with what i went through and when i was going through it, it was like a cuck but when i got out of there and i realized and the person that i am today the being that i'm sitting here being and i look back and i'm like wow i was so super grateful for that you know mm -hmm. and so so that's the way that i perceive of adversity and different things in this life and so i just want to say thank you for for the opportunity to connect in this way, like a really on a, like a family level kind of feel. And, and also for Craig, I can feel like his consciousness too, he's a very evolved being. And so, so to have those kind of discussions really gives me a lot of um, as well, you know, like mm. it pumps me up because it's like the relation that we can talk about these things and we can allow for things to come out and we can, speak truth from our hearts mm. and so i want to just say thank you thank you for that mm. my pleasure but oh, thank, thank you. you joe pleasure and just briefly from my side man like i mean look gary said it all uh, there, there's so much i would want to say here but certainly alignment is so tangible when speaking to you and the words you're using are you know words mean things they carry a vibration and just hearing you say words like vital and humility and reverence and these are real powerful things and i and i love like how you use these words seriously it's like 
I get goosebumps now just like using the words, you know what I mean? And so thank you for that. Like that's just, once again, like seeing this, this big, strong hero of so many youngsters and myself alike, you know, um, be able to be so articulate and heart centered. So I was thinking <laughs> as soon as I was halfway through this chat, I was thinking this word kept coming to me. I was like, it, it, it's really, it's big heart space, Joe jungle. Like that you've got this fucking <laughs> massive heart space, but seriously, like you can feel it across the, the, the freaking country, the, the world. You know what I mean? So like really awesome, man. And you really are a spiritual being in this human form, which is you're embodying that. And I think I always think that embodying something is the, the real teacher for others. You know, when, when someone embodies purity of food and thought and doing it's, it's very attractive and it helps us to see that I can do that too, not just from the words telling, but doing. So these are all things that I think I'm going to just have to like digest a bit more, but thanks so much for that. I'm just so grateful for this connection as well, man. So keep it up, man. So yeah, man, like such an honor to connect with both of you today. Like, yeah, man. I, I feel like your consciousness brother is like boop and with the show, I said it should be the show. It shouldn't be ridiculous humor. It should be goosebumps for, goose like for humor. Like it's, you know, like we're all sitting here. It's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the but thing is, the, fa the fascinating thing too is like talking about truth. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's in a lot of ways, not able to express always. But I think that a lot of times when, when, we, when we talk from our hearts, it's it's true and mm. like i get my the way that i see that is when i watch like the different things like say a politician talking or this one minute it's this the next it's this and it's just changing but when it's coming from the heart it's like boom you know it's like mm. okay this is a, this is truth from where the experience has come it's a truth and so so for for being able to share that that's all that it is and that's why as i said to you before the the story is is like the the ridiculously human podcast like the story of beings is so powerful it's like tangible like how it's like tantalizing tangible because it's like because it's exactly what you say it's it's not just like creating something in your mind or something that you've learned through mm. um through just reading or through learning but you've learned it through experiential events and then mm. the wisdom can really be like like it can really manifest in the way mm. that it should uh, totally, from, from like from the perspective of of like your life you know and mm. so so yeah no doubt like all these things that happen to us and all the things that we think are like so tough and hard and all of these things they're gonna come we know mm. Um, but but it's like definitely being able to talk like this and being brothers and creating community and creating those links for me are, are crucial now because mm. it's like everything that's going on in our like on planet earth right now all of these bizarre things that are taking place all of the things that have been staring uh, said the narrative that we're being sold the virus all of these different things i think that our humanity now more than ever needs each other we need these links because mm. otherwise like how else are we gonna get through what's happening you know yeah so true so, thanks yeah. again yeah. thanks and, so much uh, buddy yeah. waking at dawn packing the gear september tour and up in the air stop at the toll digging 